Well, we're going to be continuing our study in the book of Isaiah this morning. We started in Isaiah 1, and we are all the way to Isaiah 5, and we should get to Isaiah 66 sometime around when Jesus comes back. <laughs> Which wouldn't be a bad way to finish a certain series, if you ask me. Uh, that'd be the ultimate sermon illustration, wouldn't it? Preaching in the new heavens and the new earth, Isaiah 65, 66. You can't plan that. <laughs> We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, Isaiah 5, if you couldn't pick up on it from George's reading, is like the breaking bad of chapters in the Bible. It is dark. And there is, at least at first glance, no grace. There is all judgment. There is lots of sin on top of sin and injustice. And God is really mad. If you're a visitor with us, I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> but I think as we get into it, what you're going to see, as is always the case in the Bible, on the other side of judgment is grace and mercy and something beauty and glorious. That's what we're going to see this morning. The book of Isaiah is broken up into two halves Isaiah 1 through chapter 39. In Isaiah 40 through 66. The first half of the book of Isaiah, that is chapters 1 through 39, are primarily concerned with three themes. The first theme is that God controls the future of all nations with absolute sovereignty. This will become way more clear as we get into some of Isaiah's later prophecies. Secondly, Isaiah 1 through 39. It's going to show us that Israel's pride was going to lead to God's punishment. That is going to be painfully clear in our passage this morning. And then thirdly, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, the first half of this book, but we're spending our time. The third thing that we'll see is that their only hope was to trust in God and exalt Him. Really, these are the three big themes. That God is sovereign over the nations. Israel's pride was going to bring God's judgment against them. And their only hope was to trust God in His grace and to exalt Him alone. Well, chapter 1, which we were in just about a month ago, chapter 1 introduces the book as a whole. All of the themes that you find coursing throughout the book, you'll find in chapter 1. In Isaiah chapter 2 through chapter 4, we see a conflict. A conflict between what the nation of Israel was called to be and what they really were in reality. And the two were very far apart. And that section, Isaiah chapter 2 through chapter 4, begins and ends with glorious visions of God's new heavens and his new earth, where all of the nations from all of the earth are coming to exalt him, to praise him and obey him and walk with him, and they are heeding the call of his word. They are flocking upstream supernaturally to Mount Zion. And all of it hinges, as we saw at the end of Isaiah chapter 4 last week, on the branch of the Lord. The branch of the Lord who will save his people. He will make them holy and purify them, forgiving their sins. And he will dwell in their midst. That they, he, they will enjoy the intimacy with him. They will find comfort from him. And he will be their security. The Bible says he is a refuge and their shelter. That's where we ended last week. And it's on the heels of that promise that we go into Isaiah chapter 5. Because in chapter 5, now we're not looking so much at what God is promising to do in the future. What we're looking at is Israel's condition at the time of Isaiah's preaching ministry. So Isaiah is a prophet that has been called by God. God has given him words to speak to the nation of Israel, God's people, so that they might hear God's words, turn from their sin, and trust in him. So Isaiah, preaching hard messages, is God's grace to God's people. Sometimes we take hard messages are just preachers being mean. 
And that may be the case sometimes, unfortunately. But when God's messengers are speaking God's word, even if it stings, we always need to take that as God's grace. And that is exactly what we find in Isaiah chapter 5. Here during this time, in Isaiah chapter 1, all the way through Isaiah chapter 5, we are in the time of King Uzziah's reign. If you just flip over a page, you'll see at the beginning of, of 6, in the year that King Uzziah died. So we're going to see Uzziah die in chapter 6, verse 1. But everything prior to this, the context, is Uzziah's reign. And in the course of Uzziah's reign, Israel, that is Judah, the southern kingdom, had accumulated a large army and lots of wealth. And as seasons of prosperity are thrown to do in all of our lives, King Uzziah and all of the rulers under him became proud. They trusted in their financial and military strength and not in God. They became proud, and that would be that would come before the fall. And what we're going to see in Isaiah 5 is that this attitude is going to lead. It's going to lead to their defeat by an unstoppable army that, is, that God himself is going to sin against them. That's what we're going to see at the end of the chapter. But the big idea is really this. Overall, the big idea is that we are, in the words of the Apostle Paul, to be careful to not receive the grace of God. That is what Isaiah 5 is all about. The grace of God intends to produce fruit in us. We must be careful not to take this grace in vain. That's the big idea of the passage. God's grace intends to produce fruit in us. Do not receive God's grace in vain. Well, we're going to see two points here. We're going to see in the first seven verses a poem, a song. Really, it's a parable in the form of a song, and it is the most significant part of the passage because it drives everything else in Isaiah chapter 5. We're going to spend a little bit of time there. And so the first point that we're going to see then in verses 1 through 7 is that God's grace should produce good fruit. God's grace should produce good fruit. That's Isaiah 5, chapter number, verses 1 through 7. And then in verses 8, all the way through the end of the chapter, we are going to see our second point, and that is that God's grace, or rather that spiritual rebellion, produces rotten fruit. Spiritual rebellion produces rotten fruit. As we're going to see, rotten fruit produces judgment. But just consider this first point, that God's grace should produce good fruit. Here we're going to see a song, beginning in verse 1. Here's what Isaiah says, Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. He opens up his song singing about my beloved. In fact, he does that in the first two verses. Isaiah is going to sing for his beloved. And then in verses 3 and 4, Isaiah is going to sing as his beloved. And then in verses 5 and 6, Isaiah is going to reveal the beloved. And then in verse 7, he's going to reveal who the vine is. But here in verse 1, he says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. Isaiah knows that he's got a hard message that's coming to Israel. And so he's going to come with song. Now, how many of you spouses know that you are going to have a hard conversation? With your spouse, it might be wise to lead with a song. That's what I do. That's what Isaiah does. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. Some people would think perhaps that, that this love song, in a literary sense, is following that idea at the end of verse 5 of a canopy. That word canopy is referring to a, a wedding canopy. So Isaiah just got done preaching about a wedding, a wedding between the Messiah and his people. And it seems like he's just continuing this love song. So he starts singing, let me sing a song for my beloved. 
Let me sing my love song concerning his vineyard. The possible setting of this song, according to scholars, would be the end of the great parts. It'd be right around the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. It'd be a time for entertainment and festivity, so it wouldn't have been unnatural for, for there to be singing and song and merriment. It seems like that's how Isaiah begins. But notice, he goes on, My beloved, he says, had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones and he planted it with choice vines and he built a watchtower in the midst of it. And he hewed out a wine vat and he, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. So here in these first two verses, we see two subjects. We see the vineyard owner and we see the vineyard. These two subjects are going to be the object of the song. It's going to be right at the center of Isaiah's song. And we see at the end of verse 2 that this vineyard has produced wild grapes. In Hebrew, it's literally stink fruit. It has produced stinky fruit. And so the question is, well, then what went wrong? Boy, the song started off so great. All of a sudden, we're just not in the stanza in, and there's stinky fruit. What's happening? Who is to blame? for this stinky fruit, well, in verse 3, gives us only two options. Does the fault lie with the vineyard, or does the fault lie with the owner? Isaiah sings, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. Judah goes from singing for his beloved to now singing on behalf of his beloved. And he's inviting his audience to make a judgment. I want you to cast a verdict. Whose fault is it? That the vineyard is not bearing good fruit, but rather is bearing stinky fruit. Wild grapes. So he says, judge between me and my vineyard. Well, if you listen to what Isaiah had just sung, the evidence is clear. When we consider the vineyard owner's care, that you can't blame his land because in the end of verse 1, he planted on a very fertile hill. You can't blame his preparation because he dug that hill and he cleared it with stones. You can't blame the vine because he planted the choicest vines, verse 2. And you can't blame the expectations. It's not like the, the vineyard owner had, had too high of expectations. No, he built a watchtower and he hewed out a wine vat. He established for himself a permanent dwelling and he established permanent storage. He had every anticipation, confident, that this vineyard was going to produce lots and lots of really good fruit. Moreover, you can't blame his protection. He doubly protected this vineyard. We see in verse 5, not just with a hedge, but also with a wall. And so given all of this in verse 4, the beloved asks, this is Isaiah speaking, singing on behalf of beloved, what more is there to do that I have not done? In other words, I have done everything that I needed to do and then some for this vineyard to produce good fruit. And so the verdict is an easy one. And Isaiah's audience knew it immediately. It's Isaiah's doing something similar here. You remember what, excuse me, what, um, what Jonathan had done to David. Is Jonathan and David? I just yes. yes. What Jonathan had done to David. And we came up and confronted him in a parable. And the parable was meant to give David an easy verdict. He goes, who is that man? He deserves to die. And he flips the script and goes, well, that was you. Nathan. Nathan, Nathan. that's right. John Nathan. There we go. John Nathan. John Nathan. If you knew he was not that stuff going on. Nevertheless, the verdict is easy. Nathan had come to David in that way. You know, Isaiah was coming to Israel in that way. And they knew it immediately. The fault doesn't lie with the vineyard. The, the fault lies with the vineyard. And so that Israel's verdict was clear as seen in the next stanza of the song. Because it's there the vineyard owner takes action. Verse 5. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. 
Action number one, by the way, you notice that a word or a phrase repeating itself? I will, I will, I will, I will. He is taking action. Action number one, he says, I'm not going to protect it anymore in verse five. I will remove its hedge and I will break down its wall. And what is the consequence? It's going to be devoured and it's going to be trampled down. I'm going to remove its protection. I'm not going to protect it anymore. Action number two, not only is he not going to protect it anymore, then he's not even going to care for it anymore. He says, I will make it a waste. It is not going to be pruned or hoped. The briars and the thorns are going to grow up. It's interesting that Isaiah uses similar language to the language of the curse in Genesis 3, of briars and thorns growing up around it, strangling its fruitfulness. And then the third action, not only will he not protect it, not only will he not care for it, but he says in verse, in action number three there in verse six, I won't even rain on it anymore. He says, I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now you see in Isaiah's song, the mask is beginning to come off. What kind of vineyard owner commands the clouds and the rain? Only God can withhold it. Isaiah's beloved is none other than Israel's God, and he will not merely abandon his vineyard, but assist in its destruction. But the question remains, if this vineyard owner is God, if he is Israel or Isaiah's beloved, then who is the vineyard? Well, Isaiah confronts them with that truth in verse 7. He says, you inhabit this in Jerusalem. You men of Judah, you are the vineyard. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plenty. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Notice that phrase there in the middle of verse 7, he looked. We see that same phrase in verse 2. We see it again in verse 4. Isaiah is just using a play on phrase. Play on this phrase. That God is the vineyard of Israel is the vineyard. He is looking for the vineyard to bear good fruit. He's looking for it. And that good fruit, according to Isaiah in his song here in verse 7, is justice and righteousness. But notice that it yielded only stinky fruit. And that stinky fruit, those wild grapes, were bloodshed and cries of distress. It's interesting that in Hebrew, Isaiah uses a play on the words here. That he looked for justice, mishpat. But behold, there was bloodshed, mishpat. For righteousness, said God. But behold, an outcry, say God. And he's making abundantly clear that what God intended is not what has been produced. One commentator captures the sense of verse 7 in English probably as well as you can, that God looked for right, but saw only riot. He looked for decency, but found only despair. That it was bad fruit. And this idea of justice is the righting of wrongs, whereas bloodshed is the inflicting of wrongs. Righteousness is right living and right relationships, but the outcry, or well, that implies wrong living and broken relationships. God had expected it to yield grapes and it yielded wild grapes. But Israel had received the grace of God in vain. They were the object of God's redeeming love. They were the object of God's special care. That was evident from the beginning of the song. That God had given them great promises in Abraham. He had redeemed them from slavery by Moses. He had provided manna for them in the wilderness, even gave them water from a rock. He had led them in their conquest of the promised land under Joshua. He was patient with them through the rebellious years of the judges. He flourished them under the godly leadership of David, and he warned them of sin by sending them prophets to preach to them. God's grace should have produced good fruit, but Israel received his grace in vain, and they produced only bad fruit. So in verses 8 through 30, what Isaiah is going to do is pronounce six woes in response to this bad fruit. It's going to be like Isaiah is just wandering through the vineyard, plucking fruit and identifying what it is. That's what he's going to do the rest of the chapter. 
But before we go, before we go there, I, I think there's just a couple of questions that we need to ask for this first set of verses from Isaiah's song. Naturally, the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, are we bearing fruit? Are we bearing fruit? Are we bearing the sweet fruit consistent with the beauty of grace? Are we growing in love for God and love for others? Are our lives, both publicly and privately, characterized more and more by the works of the flesh or by the fruit of the Spirit? You see, the matter isn't whether or not you are bearing fruit or not bearing fruit. The question is whether or not you and I are bearing good fruit or whether we are bearing sneaky wrong fruit. Um, whether or not we are being transformed by God's grace and producing more fruit or whether we are producing bad fruit, having received his grace. I think this is the heart of what Paul admonishes the church to do when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure that you are, in fact, in the Lord. Do you truly belong to him? As we saw in John 15, there was a long term bear fruit. That fruit looks like love. Then it looks like the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And against these, there is no law. That it adores the doctrine of God and makes God look good. Are we bearing fruit? And if the answer is ever no in our lives, then we need to ask ourselves a second question. What more is there for God to do that it is not already done? What more is there for God to do for you than he has not already done? Friend, listen to me. God can never be blamed for bad fruit in your life. And yet we say things like, if only I had more time, or if only I had a different wife or a different husband, if only, if only I had a different upbringing, different parents, or if only my job wasn't so demanding, if only I had just a little bit more money, if only, if only, if only, well then I'm really good for God. But all of these are excuses. But at the bottom of each one of these implies a criticism of God and of His providence in your life, as if He hasn't given us everything that we need to live well for Him. Friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, I want you to give consideration to the fact that the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that every single person sitting in here and around you, including yourself, has rebelled against God, has failed to obey His law, and as such is a sinner. And the Bible says the wages which you earn from sin is death, and yet here you are. Living here yet another day, that He has given you life, and He has given you breath in your lungs, and that is all by God's grace. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 2, do not think lightly of the patience of God. Do not think that because he hasn't judged you, that he will not judge sin. But rather that his kindness is aimed to lead many to repentance. Friend, have you ever thought to consider that the reason that you're not struck dead because of your sin, the reason that God in his grace has restrained the full effects of sin in your life is so that your eyes might be opened by His grace to your need for a Savior. That you can't save yourself. But that God in His grace has made a way for sinners to escape death and live forever in joy with Him. And that is through the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Is that news to you? And if it is, is it good news to you? Oh, I hope that it is, and I hope that you'll trust in Christ. But if you're here and you're a Christian, then we need to continue to ask this question. What more is there for God to do that he's not already done for you? 
God chose you from before the foundations of the world and by His grace alone brought you to repent and believe in Christ. And if by His grace you have become one with Christ and in Him you have perfect righteousness and you have a new name. You were once an enemy of God. And you were a slave to sin. But God has lavished His grace on you by making you sons and daughters and heirs with Christ in His household. And then by grace, you have been indwelt with His Holy Spirit who has sealed you for the day of redemption. And He has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. That by grace, you have been given an inheritance that is imperishable, it is undefiled, it is unfading, and it is being kept in heaven for you. That by grace, you have been predestined, called, justified, and glorified all in Christ. What more is there for him to do that he's not already done? He has left us without excuse. When he has empowered us by almighty, world-creating, sinner-regenerating power to live for his glory. God hasn't been chintzy with you. He has given you all things for life and godliness. Everything that you need. And so the question when we look at fruit in our lives is not to look outwards and go, well, if only God gave me a little bit more, then maybe I'd be a little bit more holy or happy. The question that we need to ask is the same question that we see in verse 4. What more is there to do for my vineyard that I have not already done in Christ? He's done everything. So when you're tempted to implicitly blame God by blaming people or blaming your circumstances for sinful fruit in your life, I wouldn't be so angry if it, well, if I wasn't hungry, but I wouldn't be so angry if I got more sleep, made a little bit better, my kids weren't so this way, my husband or my wife wasn't so this way, my job or my boss weren't this way, I wouldn't be so anxious, I wouldn't be so any of these things. In all of those ways, we're saying God has somehow dealt harshly and falsely or is withholding. And we believe that lie that the enemy says in Genesis chapter 3, when he causes us to question God's goodness. God is good. So when you're tempted to blame God for blaming people or circumstances or sinful fruit in your life, look at Christ. Think upon his incarnation. Think on the cross and be reminded of his resurrection from the dead and ask what more was there to do for my vineyard that I have already done. He has done all things well for us. And he has given us all things for life. Do you believe that? That's the gospel. But Isaiah's going to go in here for the rest of the chapter, strolling through the vineyard, plucking the fruit, gathering evidence. Let me show you what kind of stinky fruit is in your lives. You men of Jerusalem, you inhabitants of Judah. <coughs> And piece by piece, he's going to gather together this offensive fruit. And what we're going to see is six woes that correspond with six kinds of fruit. The first two woes that we're going to see in verses 8 through 11 deal with the abuse of material benefits. And then those two woes are followed, notice in verse 13, by a therefore judgment. And that spans from verse 13 all the way to verse 17. And then he's going to pick up with another set of four woes in verses 18 all the way to 23. And that's going to deal primarily with the moral and spiritual failure. And he's going to follow that with yet another therefore judgment in verses 23 and 30. So we've got two woes and a therefore, then four woes and some therefores. And that's how the rest of the chapter is structured. Go back to verse 8. Because what we're going to see is Isaiah began doing a spiritual autopsy. He is opening up their chest to see what is going wrong. And he's going to find that their heart is disease in the crime. He says in verse 8, Woe to those who join house to house, who add field to field until there is no more room, 
and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts has sworn in my hearing, surely many houses will be desolate, large and beautiful houses without inhabitant. That the rich of Isaiah's day were using legal processes to defraud the, the poor, to defraud them of their land so that they could add land to their own holdings and increase their wealth. Now you got to understand, there wasn't anything wrong with the law per se, but just because something is legal doesn't make it moral. God's law provided permission for those who were poor to sell their land to make ends meet. But that land was to come back to them eventually, either by them paying back and getting it, reacquiring it and purchase, or in the year of Jubilee, it would be given back to them. It would be God's grace. The idea was that we don't take, within God's people, we don't take financial advantage of one another. That when God brought Israel into the land, the land was allotted out to various families, and it was intended to stay in connection with those families in perpetuity. The law allowed for provision for those who had more to take care of those who were less by taking care of their land as they would, as the poor would sell their land to them, and they would end up getting it back. We kind of understood that if I purchased your land, it's not really my land, it's kind of your land, and you can buy it back. It's kind of like land on Leo. Unless, of course, you can't do it, then you're a Jew. Well, they were looking for loopholes in God's law, as sinners are prone to do, and they were defrauding the poor of their land so that they could add that land to their own holdings and they could increase their wealth. Now understand, the Bible is not opposed to building wealth. The Bible is opposed to gaining wealth in unjust ways. And that's exactly what they were doing. And so God tells them in verse 9 that many houses will be desolate, large and beautiful houses will be without inhabitants. Verse 10, 10 acres of vineyards shall yield but one bath, and a homer of seed shall yield but an ephah. A bath is six gallons. That would be a meager yield for 10 acres of land. And a homer was the equivalent of 10 ephahs. In other words, the crop was only one-tenth of the total seed sown. When you sow seed, you expect for that seed to multiply. But it's not even a tenth of the seed that was sown. The point is this, that those who sow receive gain by unjust means will not ultimately experience the harvest that they expect. That they would agree. It's not coincidental that the last command in the Decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, is a command against covetousness. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's also not incidental that the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3 said that covetousness is at the very root of idolatry. It is self-worship at its most base level. And that's exactly what we're doing here. And that covetousness played itself out in wild grape number two. So if wild grape number one was greed in verses 8 through 10, then wild grape number two is debauchery, verses 11 and 12. What are those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late in the evenings, wine inflames them? They have lyre and heart, tambourine and flute, and wine at their feast, but they don't regard the deeds of the Lord, and they don't see the work of his hands. Their sensual indulgence, there in verses 11 and the first part of verse 12, you notice at the end of 12 produces spiritual blindness. And in verse 11, drinking is what gets them out of bed in the morning, and drinking is what keeps them out of bed throughout the day. But when the passion for pleasure becomes ultimate in a person's life, then passion for God and His ways will always be squeezed out. And that's what we see here. Their passion for God had been squeezed out by their passion for pleasure. For losing their inhibitions, for getting some me time, for partying, joy and merit and laughter. None of which in and of itself is a bad thing. But when those things become ultimate things, then they become bad things. And so in verses 13 and 17, on the basis of these two woes of their greed and their debauchery, the way that they, of they, the way that they abuse material comforts and wealth, he gives them a judgment that's rightly in keeping with, ironically, with their own sin. 
He says, therefore, in verse 13, notice here the party has come to an end. Therefore, my people go into exile for the lack of knowledge. Their honored men go hungry. Multitude parched with thirst. Sheol's enlarged its appetite and opened its mouth beyond measure. The nobility of Jerusalem and her multitude go down her revelers, and he who exalts her. Man is humbled. Each one is brought low. The eyes of the haughty are brought low. But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. Then shall the lands graze as in their pasture the nomads shall eat among the ruins of the rich. Then verse 13, notice the irony. Those who feasted, God says, will go hungry. And those who were previously inflamed with wine are now going to be parched with thirst. Verse 14, fulfilling their appetites is all that they lived for. But now, verse 14, ironically, the judgment for those who live by their appetites is to be devoured by a greater appetite than their own. Sheol has enlarged its appetite and opens its mouth. Sheol is, is the grave that death is waiting for them. And verse 15, that phrase, the eyes, the eyes of the haughty, the eyes were seen, it's an image for the, for the organs of desire, and it's referring back to their covetousness and greed. Well, their prideful eyes, their, their proud desires, all of these are going to be humbled because in verse 16, God's justice and righteousness is going to come against their lack of justice and righteousness. That was the fruit he was looking for. And that fruit looks a lot like God, and it was completely absent. So now God, in his justice and his righteousness, is going to come against them. And the result, look at verse 17, is that the land shall graze into the pasture, and no man shall be among the ruins, the rich. At the beginning, it looks like that's kind of a peaceful scene, but it's not. It's a scene of destruction. It's livestock are running free in a previously well-tended land. It's chaos, out of control. It's destruction. They are eating among the ruins of the rich. Ruins being the key word. So that's what the gospel says. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will also reap. And that's exactly what we see in this first set of therefore judgments. They are reaping what they have sown. They, so they have sown in the ground, stinky fruit came up, and they are reaping judgment as a result. They have brought disrepute to God. And it trampled the poor rather than bring glory to God and take care of the poor. For God will not be mocked. But sadly, in verse 18 and 19, mock God is exactly what they did. And there we see wild grape number three. And that's spiritual arrogance. He says, What are those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood? We draw sin as with cart ropes. Who say, let him be quick, let him speed his work, that we may see it. Let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near, and let it come, that we may know it. Here Isaiah uses the picture of a beast harnessed to a cart. By holding on to what is false and rejecting the truth of God, they have enslaved themselves to sin. That's the image. The cart is sin that is now driving them, and they are being driven by sin according to these cords and these cart ropes. And in verse 18, the progression from cords to cart ropes, that is, smaller cords to larger ropes, implies the imagery, progressive, growing rebellion. And the more proud they grew, the more arrogant they grew toward God. And as they grew more arrogant toward God, we see in verse 19, that they put God to the test. They questioned whether or not he even cared for them. They doubted whether he was even involved in their day-to-day -day lives. They loved to compartmentalize God. They could control and manipulate on a Sunday morning. What a God that was altogether absent, conveniently so throughout the week. I don't really see his hand at work. He's been slow to judge us so far. What's to make us think that he will judge us anytime soon? And so they are sitting for the high hand. They're calling out in mocking fashion for Isaiah's God to hurry up and prove himself to them. 
wonder how often you sin. Or perhaps have known somebody to sin. Well, if God would just do this or that, then I would trust him. Friends, that is putting God to the test. And that is spiritual. To demand that God do or say more than what he has already done and already said is the height of spiritual arrogance. And that's exactly what we see here. And I want you to notice in verse 20, that spiritual arrogance of testing God has produced moral confusion. Verse 20. We see our fourth wild grave. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? That in order to justify their sinful behavior, they went to great lengths to show how their evil behavior is good. That darkness is light and bitterness is sweet. If they live today, they might say the only way that we're going to prevent the catastrophe of overpopulation and global warming is by radical late-term abortion globally. Sounds good. It's to call that which is fundamentally evil good. It's to call yourself an evangelical Christian who just happens to be a little bit more progressive in your views and yet completely contradicts God and his word about sexuality and marriage. God, nowhere in the Bible, approves of homosexuality. Not even in the case of loving monogamy as some self-professing evangelicals have been going to argue. The God has spoken, and it is clear. You don't have to have a master's degree from a theological seminary to know God's thoughts on marriage and sexuality. It is black and white. But when you are the high spiritual arrogance, and you assume that God is not acting as you think he should be acting, and moral confusion sets in. You have now no bearing, no absolute standard by which to judge what is true, what is false, what is good, and what is wrong. Then you will call evil good, and you will call that which is good evil. This is nothing new. This is sinful humanity from the dawn of the age. And it's the very thing that God, in his justice, <laughs> will come against. So they justify their sinful behavior by calling their evil behavior good. And at the end of all of this, ultimately the root of this attitude is, the, is a refusal to admit the absolute authority of God's revealed authority. One commentator put it this way, just hang with me. If this sounds familiar for our own age. For sin is not content to live alongside righteousness any more than disease will coexist with health. Sin can only be satisfied when righteousness is destroyed. If the ethical imperative is dependent upon human reason alone, then that reason is no match for rampant self-interest. In other words, there is something more powerful than our human reason and that is the sinful desires of our hearts. In fact, self-interest will press reason into service to justify its own behavior. And only a prior commitment to the revealed wisdom of God, that is wisdom that is outside of us, not that wisdom that originates with us, only a commitment to the revealed wisdom of God and a commitment to call good good, despite the reasonings of the wise of this world, can make possible genuine, long-lasting righteousness both in individuals and society. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. It will grow increasingly difficult in our culture to call good good. And the only way for us to properly love our culture in the way that Isaiah is loving Israel is to call good good, even if it costs us our tax exemptions. Good riddance, the church of our children. Even if it costs us comfort and money, even if it, as has been the case in Canada and much more so all around the world, gets his own saints put in prison for declaring that which is good, so be it. We follow Isaiah's 
example. But there is, I think, a justification for a righteous anger where we see sin that is mutilating young men and young women. That is leading to the mass infanticide of unborn babies. And calling it good for the sake of staving off global catastrophe. That is wickedness at its very core. And we can't long for the praise of this culture so much, long to be liked, long to be accepted, that we grow fearful of proclaiming that which is good is good. And that which is evil is evil. Let the chips fall with it. And brothers and sisters, let me encourage you. The efficacy of the gospel, that is what makes the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ work, is not your being liked by every non-Christian around you. Some of you have grown up hearing the idea that you have to earn the right to be heard. You don't have to earn the right to be heard. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He has already earned the right to be heard. He has commissioned his church. He has authorized us to preach his message in the world so that all of his people, by his grace, would turn from their sin and trust in his son, Christ. And that through, through many churches being planted and redeemed people being gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation all over the world, you would begin to see not only little, um, sort of the word, you begin to see culture slowly being transformed around them as people are living justly in the world according to God's word. Transformed lives, leading to transformed lives through the proclamation of the gospel. But friends, if we're committed to this idea of friendship evangelism, that we have to be friends with the world in order for the world to respond to the gospel, we will never share the gospel. That is an errant idea that assumes that your friendship is what makes the gospel work. No. Your godliness and holiness and love for your neighbor and trusting in him, all of those validate the power of the gospel. But God is the one that makes his gospel work. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. It's not faith comes by, well, that guy was really nice to me. Faith comes by, well, that guy never said anything to me to you. Condemned my choices, my lifestyle. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. That means that allegiance to the gospel is going to put us in very awkward positions, increasingly so, as, as culture continues to go the way that it goes. I'm not a doomsday type person. But the writings of Paul, this is just reality. This fourth wild grape of moral confusion, we see the fifth wild grape. That it leads this unwillingness to submit to God is rooted in the insistence of being autonomous from God. Verse 21, wild grape number five is self confidence. Woe are those who are wise in their own eyes and true in their own sight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom. The unwillingness to submit to God is rooted in the insistence of being autonomous from God, and that has been the case since Genesis 3. They don't look to God's wisdom, they look to their own wisdom. They think that they can rule their lives better than God can. God is antiquated. God is unnecessary. That is just old superstition. Our wisdom has now trumped God's wisdom. But their insistence on human wisdom led to lives that were characterized not by justice, as perhaps their campaign slogans would say, but rather by indulgence and injustice. Look at verses 22 and 23. Woe to those who are heroes who drink and wine, and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deprive the innocent of his right. Those heroes and those valiant men, Isaiah is using sarcastic language referring to military water. He's taunting them. That in their pride, they tested them. He goes, oh, look at your heroes, look at your valiant men. These men were meant to serve God. They were meant to care about justice. They were meant to take responsibility for others. That's what heroes and valiant men do. But the only thing that these men are heroic at is beer pong. It's just really If I ever had a sermon to preach, perhaps it was a 
fraternities and the sororities in this town will preach the gospel from Isaiah chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. You're wasting your life. On the heels of all of this, verses 24 to the end of the chapter, judgment once again has been promised. And once again, the punishment fits the crime. In verse 24, in their pride, they tested the Lord and taunted him. Remember verse 19? Let him speed in his work that we may see it. Well, Isaiah says in verse 24, well, the Lord's going to be quick, all right. As quick in his judgments is fire devouring dry grass. They produce the fruit of unrighteousness. But now that root in verse 24 is going to be exposed as rotten, and the blossom is going to fade like dust. Verse 25, it seems to suggest that God was already acting in judgment against them. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he stretched out his hand against them, and he struck them, and the mountains quaked. Their corpses were his refuge, and the refuse in the midst of the streets, for all of his anger is not turned away, and his hand is stretched out still. Both Amos and Zechariah speak of an earthquake that took place in the days of Uzziah, and that's the same time that Isaiah was preaching. And so here Isaiah is giving a theological interpretation to a natural disaster. He reminds them that the created world is a control tool in the hand of the creator to accomplish all of his purposes in and for his people. And that's exactly what he's done here. That he makes it to serve his righteous purposes. That earthquake in verse 25 was God's divine therefore to Israel's rejection of his law and the despising of his word in verse 25. And Isaiah tells him in this earthquake in verse 25, that is only a foretaste of the greater judgment to come. Because the ground is about to quake, not with shifting tectonic plates, but rather it is going to quake with marching boots. Verse 26, he will raise a signal for the nations far away. Whistle for them from the ends of the earth, and behold, quickly, speedily they come. None is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleeps, not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp, their bows are bent, their horses' hooves seem like flint, and their wheels are like whirlwind. All of that is literary devices used by, by Isaiah to make the point. He has Assyria in view, the nation of Assyria just to the north of, of Israel, and they're going to ravish nearly all of Judah before the end of 8th century BC, sometime after Isaiah's preaching this. And we notice in verse 26 that when God whistles, well, the nations come like a dog would come to do his bidding. And his bidding is for the nations to come against Israel. And that's why in verses 27 and 28, the cadence of Isaiah's poem here is like the cadence of a military march. He wants everything, not just in the words that I say, but even in how I say it, to drive home the point that judgment is coming. Boom, 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 it's coming. And in that day, verses 28 to 30, you will be helpless. And he gives us a double picture of helplessness. Verse 29, rather. In verse 29, they will be like prey before a lion who sees them. That lion will drag them away, and there will be no one to deliver them. And that roaring of the lion, verse 29, will be like the roaring of the sea. And they're going to be like storm-tossed sailors with no safe place to land. Notice that he looks to the land because the sea is going to kill him. And what does he see on the land? Nothing but darkness and distress. There's no place to hide. There's no place to run. They cannot escape. It is a picture of helplessness. God is decided to act because of your sin. That's a lot of stuff in this passage. Let me give you a handful of quick applications. I'm just going to do I'll try to do it about five minutes. Application number one, we have to be really careful not to read the Old Testament the way we read the New Testament. So we don't read the New Testament the way we read the Old Testament. And then what we see God doing with Israel here, Isaiah chapter 5, 
needs to be understood in the history of God's redeeming plan for humanity. Because in all of the ways that Isaiah has failed, or rather that Israel has failed, all of that points to a true and better Israel yet to come, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. That in all of the ways that Judah and Jerusalem failed to bear good fruit of justice and of righteousness, Christ Jesus, the true Israel, from Israel, will bear fruit in keeping with justice and righteousness as a perfect fulfillment of God's law. In other words, Jesus is going to make a new covenant, and that new covenant is going to do what an old covenant that Israel was under could never do. That the law under the old covenant, no man, no man can be justified by the law to stand righteous. And yet Christ came and lived in such a way that he fulfilled every requirement of the law. The law was fulfilled in him. He was in every way what Israel was meant to be, but failed to be. He's the true Israel. So when you get to John chapter 15, which we had read earlier, about abide in me and I in you and bear much fruit, did you notice what he said at the very beginning? I am the vine. What is he talking about? He goes, I am the true and better fulfillment of the vine that failed. I am the vine that will never fail. I am the vine that always bears much fruit. And if you are in me, that is, you have been brought by God's grace to repent and to trust in Christ, and you have been united to him, then his fruit-bearing power becomes your fruit-bearing power. His sap now courses through you in such a way that gives you life and fruitfulness. The Father is the vine dresser, always pruning, disciplining, but so that we might bear more fruit. And so this points to this fact. That what we see in Isaiah is pointing forward to the gospel, because the gospel does what the law can't do in Isaiah. The law can show them their sin, the law can point them to their need for a redeemer, but the law cannot redeem them. Only Christ is that. And Christ is coming. And he has fulfilled the law, and we have been called now to put our trust wholly in him. His righteousness now becoming our righteousness. We abide in him, and now we become fruitful in him. Then we become in Christ the true Israel. Being fruitful in all the ways that God has seen. There's a second application, and that's this. That Isaiah 5 follows Isaiah 4. Isaiah 4 is all about future grace, what God is going to do. Isaiah 5 is all about present realities. Our discipleship occurs in the tension between our future destiny and our present condition. That we live in a tension of an already and not yet. Of God accomplishing glorious things in Christ and yet sin still remaining. And that's right at the heart of our discipleship. But what we need to get in our minds, in our hearts, is that that future grace does not take away present responsibility. God doesn't give promises for the future and then go, well, it's going to happen, so just live any way you want. You're good to go. Present day sin carries present day consequences. That the grace of God never leads us to lawlessness that it leads us to greater love for and obedience to God's love. That's what God's grace was intended to do. Have you received God's grace in vain? Oh, may not ever be said of us that that would be the If we've got hell insurance in our back pocket, we can live any way that we want. God takes sin seriously and so do we. But we take the grace of God in Christ even more seriously. We want to see ourselves transformed in Christ in such a way that we bear fruit and grace in the world. Because we are the true Israel. God is doing in us through Christ. But Israel did not do it. Praise God for his grace.